This weekend marks the 61st running of the Rolex 24 Daytona, and through its previous 60 runnings, various drivers across all platforms and motorsports have ran the event. That includes NASCAR Cup drivers, which if you look across the many NASCAR greats that have come through the sport in the last 20 years, more than likely they have run at least one Rolex 24. However, many of these drivers have never won the event. The predominant oval series has only seen a handful of drivers claim a Rolex watch. Jeff Gordon is the most recent winner in 2017, and Casey Mears claimed the victory in 2006. While both these drivers are listed as winners of the Rolex 24, both of them come with an asterisk for many endurance fans. Gordon's 17 victory was at the aid of the Taylor brothers, along with Max Angelelli, all prolific endurance and road drivers. Gordon was known to be the best road racer in NASCAR history, but in terms of endurance racing, he was by far the least experienced. Mears in 2006 was one of only three drivers for Chip Ganassi. However, the other two drivers were Scott Dixon and Dan Weldon. Mears had also come from a background uncommon to NASCAR drivers. So to say he was solely a NASCAR driver is barely applicable. However, two cup drivers, both with backgrounds distant from endurance racing, came through and claimed overall victory in one of the most bizarre driver combinations in Rolex history. This is the story of how Jay McMurray and Kyle Larson won the Rolex 24. Chip Ganassi Racing, a team which expands drastically from just a NASCAR team, had entered the 24s for years. Usually the teams are assembled as an amalgamation of sports car regulars that run for the team full time, and then top level drivers from different series willing to take road racing more seriously. For 2015, their O2 car would have four drivers, all from different series. The first driver selected was one with a lengthy history in the Rolex 24, Scott Dixon. Dixon at the time of the 2015 race had only ever won one Rolex 24, the 2006 edition as mentioned before. He had run the event though every year for Ganassi since 2004, hence he was always a proverbial lock for the car. The next driver was Ganassi's other IndyCar driver, open wheel veteran Tony Kanaan. TK's history in the race was very sparse. He had run it in 1998, racing for Tom Gloy in a Mustang. He co-drove that race with Mike Borkowski and Robbie Buell. He grabbed third in class and 11th overall that year. 15 years later though, TK ran again for Denner Motorsports in 2013, with an all-Brazilian cast of drivers. In 2014, TK ran with Dixon and Ganassi, getting 8th in a prototype class car, 15th overall. Besides Dixon, he co-drove with Marino Franchitti, and then NASCAR Cup rookie Kyle Larson. Larson was in his first Rolex in 2014, and at that point he was getting his first large influx of road racing. The primarily dirt and oval driver had never really gone head deep in endurance and road racing. But with more experience and on the head of surprising results in 2014, they decided to keep him for the 2015 race. Finally, the fourth driver was no other than Jamie McMurray. McMurray ran his first 24 in 2005 for Chip Ganassi. When he came back to Ganassi in 2010, he had run every year for Chip in the race, including a second place overall finish in 2011. Chip for years usually took the IndyCar NASCAR drivers and spread them across the cars. 2015 though, he decided to put them in one car. They would drive the aforementioned O2, whilst Joey Hand, Sage Karam, Charlie Kimball, and Scott Pruitt would sit in the 01. What nobody realized, though, was that they had just built a powerhouse team, one that would surprise everyone. For qualifying, the O2 team qualified second. They would be behind the number 60 team, headed by AJ Allmendinger, Matthew McMurray, Oswaldo Negri Jr., and John Pugh. The other team qualified third, and fourth was the Action Express number 5, with Barbosa, Sebastian Bourdais, and Christian Fittipaldi. Other competing teams in the prototype class included Delta Wing Racing, with its four drivers, Crone Racing, Star Wars Motorsports, the second 31 Action Express entry, and of course, the number 10 Wayne Taylor Racing entry. This year, the car featured Max Angelelli, along with Ricky and Jordan Taylor. On Saturday, January 24th, 2015, the 53rd Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona went green. Automotive fraternity is simple, bragging rights, hoping to dominate and win Daytona. Oh, bragging rights, it all starts right here. The green flag flies on the 53rd running of the Rolex 24 at Daytona, and Oz Negre on the inside, but they're racing close already. They are Scott Dixon, pushes that target machine to the outside, and he goes for the lead. Immediately as the race goes green, Scott Dixon, the starting driver for the O2, darts around the 60 to take the lead early. The first of the prototypes to have issues early is the Delta Wing, which pits but has smoke coming from the rear. Soon pit stops start, and around this time, the number 10 Wayne Taylor team reports a misfire. The 31 crew soon removed the front bodywork in the pits, and a caution comes out. The 45 was stalled and needed a tow. 
Under caution, it is beginning to be learned that perhaps the misfire for the Wayne Taylor Corvette may be due to a widespread trash control issue in the Corvettes in general. The race goes back green, and within a blink of an eye, the Ganassi Fords are gone. There suddenly is a race, though, by a caution for the GB Porsche crashed in Turn 1. The Delta Wing is also stopped there, but it is unknown why. The race quickly goes back green and runs to the next cycle, where Dixon comes in. Originally, this would have been when Jamie McMurray was planning to get in the car, but the opt for Dixon to keep going. Meanwhile, the Delta Wing is having a disaster of a race. There is a reported gear shift linkage issue, and the number zero may become the first prototype retirement. They keep going, though, and the race approaches 5 p.m. local. Rubens Barrichello has charged his team to the top three. Meanwhile, at 5 p.m., Dixon comes in, and then McMurray is getting in. Jamie will take over a five-second lead over the Wayne Taylor 10, and Jordan Taylor, piloting the number 10 Corvette, chases down McMurray and passes him. At 5.15, the 19 Porsche stalls, and the third yellow has come out. The race comes back green past 5.30, and the fastest Ganassi is in McMurray in the 02. It's Sage Karam in the 01, setting the fastest lap of the race so far. Karam now leads as the clock passes 6 p.m. Eastern, and soon he pits. Jordan Taylor comes in and reports that the electronic trash control issue has been resolved and is ready to give the Ganassis hell. It is at the 6 hour mark though that the 10 is 5th. The Ganassis still sit 1-2 with the Michael Shank 63rd. The 5 Action Express entry is 4th and the last lead lap prototype is the 90 Visit Florida Corvette in 6th. As the sun sets it appears Ganassis best shot to win will be the 0-1 team as they handily have taken over the race. Through 7.30, though, pit stops persist. By 8 p.m., A.J. Allmendinger beats Karam's time and sets a 139.949. At 8.20, the Starworks DP stalls, and the yellow is out again. The field paces, and the O2 Ganassi goes behind the wall. The car has experienced a radiator issue, and now the team is frantically replacing hoses and coolant. It is done flawlessly, but at the cost of a lap, and the all-star driver crew is going to need to be on overkill to make up the time. Green flies just before 9 p.m. local which sees spinning cars as a Corvette tags a Ferrari. The O2 Ganassi is back in with some debris removed, and 20 minutes later a caution is out for the number 51 Ferrari and the 007 Aston Martin. The O2 stops again and continues messing with the nose. The race restarts past 9.30, and Bourdais now leads over the Taylors in his Corvette. The Ganassis have now floated back up to 5th and 6th, and the race pushes past 10. By 10.45, the O2 car has gotten to 3rd, 27 seconds back of the rival Taylor car. Suddenly, the 5 Action Express Corvette stops on track and brings out the caution. It loses three laps, and the race restarts past 11 p.m. After only 10 minutes, the caution comes back out for the 38 stopped, and then at 11.30, the green waves once more. It's at this time a young Kyle Larson gets in and pilots the O2 car and begins to maneuver the car up to second place. He starts chasing the Taylor 10 as the clock approaches midnight. Kyle Larson races endurance racing royalty through the Daytona night and pit stops soon occur, and Larson gets a 5 second lead through the cycle. Kyle's able to lap up to only 4 cars on the same lap as him, and the next cycle occurs with Larson now losing the lead past 12.30. Jordan Taylor leads now, but Larson doesn't give it up as he tries to chase him down towards 1am. He gets to Jordan through lap traffic and stalks him across the 12th hour. As Larson stuns the endurance world with his show of racing prowess, the factory Porsche effort goes absolutely haywire. The 911 and 912 bring out Caution 9. After scrubbing Porsche hopes and dreams off the track, Jordan leads back green at 1.45 a.m. Larson and Scott Pruitt follow him now, and Jordan is able to pull 4 seconds on Kyle, whilst Larson puts 10 on Pruitt. Jordan sets the new fastest lap of the race, and Larson pits at around 2.30. Taylor falls before Caution 10 for another stalled car, and soon Dixon gets back in the 02 and leads Jordan as the race heads to green approaching 2.45 in the morning. Quickly, another yellow for the four Corvettes slamming the tire wall. They approach 3 a.m. now, back green, and Dixon and Taylor fight again. They fight through pit stops at 3.30, and then at 4 a.m., and nearing 4.30, though, the Seven Star Works DP stalls and brings out the caution again. With Angelelli in the 10 now, they go back green with Dixon trying to run away. Karam gets involved with them in the 01, pushing both of them as morning approaches. It becomes a Ganassi 1-2 once more. And by 5 a.m., Jay McMurray has gotten back in the car. He loses the lead over Angelelli, and he builds the lead to nearly 11 seconds. But at 5.30, caution 13 for the Park Place Porsche stalls. 
McMurray comes in and tops off. And at 5.45, the race heads back green. It's now past 6 a.m. and Angelelli brings the 10 in, losing the lead. At 6.30, McMurray with the lead through the cycle comes in and Tony Kanaan hops to the car. Kanaan gets the lead back and eventually pulls the field past 7 a.m. Along with the two Ganassis, the 10 Wayne Taylor and the 5 Action Express Corvettes find themselves as the only four still in the lead lap. Kanaan soon after his lead pits to fall the third overall, giving Action Express head of the field. The 33 Viper, however, stops on track for caution 14, and the top four pit once more. Reminiscent of 12 hours ago, the O2 nose is removed as they adjust ducting. The 10 with Ricky Taylor driving now takes the lead, and the race goes back green around 7.30. With Ricky Taylor fighting Tony Kanaan, by 8 a.m. caution 15 waves, and now the 5 Action Express car gets the lead through pit stop mayhem. Through the restart, Kanaan has trouble with traffic, and Pruitt back in the O1 struggles as well. Nearing 9 a.m., Pruitt takes the lead temporarily through pit stops. And at 9 a.m., the yellow is out for the 64 Ferrari hitting the outside turn 4 wall. The green comes back out at 9.20, and Jordan Taylor back in the 10 fights Barbosa on the opening lap. Kanan, meanwhile, rides behind, waiting idly by for his opportunity to strike on them both. At nearing 10 a.m. now, Taylor goes daredevil in pit entry on the 5 car and passes the Corvette. During the cycle, TK is out, and Kyle Larson's back in the car for the morning run. The L1 comes in as well, and Karam gets in. At 10.15, the Visit Florida entry experiences mechanical issues, and by 10.30, Jordan Taylor leads over the 5 Action Express car by 8 seconds. Ganassi's ride 3rd and 4th, with Larson 15 seconds back. Soon they cycle to 1-2 before they also pit. And just before 11 a.m., the 009 Aston Martin stalls, and the yellow is out. Larson gets out, and Dixon is back in by 11 a.m., ready to take the green flag. Angelelli in the 10 leads Karam, and at 11.30 with two and a half hours to go, Dixon gets the lead through stops again, as Team Car piloted by Sage Karam reports clutch issues. Bourdais in the 5 takes advantage of the 01's issues and passes the Ford. And as the 01 pits to check the issue, Joey Hand gets in the car. The troubleshooting is taking a lengthy time for them, and at noon, the 01 goes behind the wall. Dixon pits at 12.15 taking fresh tires, and he begins to chase Taylor. Heading towards the final hour, Taylor and Dixon bear through lap traffic, with the battle tightening. They both pit and cycle Dixon to being 1.2 ahead of Taylor. With that, we enter the final hour. Taylor pushes Dixon, stalking him through every corner. Ford beats the Corvette on top end, but Taylor gobbles up the advantage to the infield section. Under 50 minutes now, and the top two continue the race towards the final stops. The 0-2 and 10 still stay close to one another, as they eclipse the final 45 minutes. The two we pass cars waiting to make the final move on stops. Third place Action Sport Corvette Bourdais pits first with 43 minutes left. And the O2 stays out at 40 minutes whilst the 10 comes in. They fill the Wayne Taylor car with fuel. And the 10 takes off and now it's up to Dixon. Coming back around he locks the tires up coming back onto the oval section. And Dixon is in the next lap finally. It's going to be fuel only. And thanks to his later previous stop he takes less fuel and will be ahead of Jordan Taylor. 37 minutes now for Taylor to chase down Dixon. And coming down to the final 33 minutes, Dixon has built a 4.5 second lead now. Everything has seemed to calm down, and Taylor can't seem to close. But as the race approaches the final 20 minutes... Of course, we have yet another dramatic twist here at the 53rd Rolex 24 at Daytona. That is the number 54 Core Auto Sports machine of Colin Braun, leader in the PC category. We quickly got a view of him stopped over in the west hairpin. He got the car backed up, got going again, and then moments later, coming out of the bus stop chicane on the back stretch, we saw him parked. He's obviously backed it into the wall. Colin Braun has crashed from the lead of his own class. And now with 17 minutes left and counting, the finish is about to go wild. The 60 is also spun, and the race eclipse is 15 minutes remaining now. Dixon is currently on a stint stretching over three hours is going to have to hold on against Jordan Taylor. Or maybe not. Jordan is coming in with 11 minutes left, and they're putting Ricky Taylor in. This not only gives up their second place run, but they also lose the chance to win as they'll have to serve a penalty under green flag. The reason being that they pitted under a closed pit, and now it'll be Sebastian Bourdais in second. The race will come down to two IndyCar greats dueling for the win, after a miscalculation of driver time between the Taylors. This is a horrendous miscue for a team as large as Wayne Taylor which makes serving the penalty under 10 minutes to go even more bitter. Eight minutes left, and it's Dixon and Bourdais ready to duel. Dixon goes, and Bourdais stalks two seconds back. Four minutes left now, and 2.5 seconds separate the two. 
It's the white flag now, and Dixon holds on as 24 hours comes down to just 120 seconds. The white flag one more waves. Here, man. One, more good one. one more lap after 23 hours and 59 minutes. It's just one more lap. Right, or to put it another way, 739 other laps. Bordet, three tenths quicker than Dixon on that last lap. Huge celebrations down there, and, and once again, what an achievement for the entire team. I know Jamie Mack will be incredibly delighted. He'll join some elite company. We talked about that for Kyle Larson. This is going to be absolutely huge. And you I see think, the Ganassi squad there. I think Jamie Mack is emotional. I Look at him on the too. left. Yeah. He needs those sunglasses because he started to moisten up a little bit. Joining the likes of Mario Andretti and A.J. Foyt as winners of the Daytona 500 and the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Carl Larson, we talked about all that he's accomplished. Tony Kanaan. I think TK might have a tear or two in his eye as well. Yeah, maybe so. Pretty special group of uh, drivers that are gathered there. Chip Ganassi with his arms around his boys. Nice. Gap is staying about the same with the BMW and the vet. Final time through the chicane. Last year, Ford brought their EcoBoost turbocharged engine to this team, and Chip Ganassi Racing gave them not only their Bring first, on, but their first three victories, including an historic return to victory lane at the 12 hours of Sebring for Ford. And now, Scott Dixon and crew will bring Ford victory in the 24 hours of Daytona for Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis. Scott Dixon, Kyle Larson, Jamie McMurray, and Tony Kanaan win the Rolex 24. It's one of the first massive accomplishments in Kyle Larson's young career. It adds yet another milestone to Jim McMurray's resume, and Tony Kanaan becomes one of a plethora of IndyCar drivers to win the Rolex 24. This race stands as the last time a full-time cup driver won the event, as weirdly the peak for Chip Ganassi's NASCAR branch of racing. Felix Sabade is one of NASCAR's legendary owners, claims one last great achievement in his career. Scott Dixon grabs a second of three overall Rolex 24 wins, being a key piece in how Kyle Larson and Jamie McMurray won the Rolex 24.